Right now at 6, new and troubling details as the man accused of stabbing two teenagers on a MAX train appears before a judge. Plus, back to school in the age of AI. Teachers, students, and families have to be in the loop. Oregon's new guidelines for using artificial intelligence in your student's classroom. And dropping fire from the sky. It sure is make, make it a little bit safer for all of us. How drones are helping firefighters reach problem spots and keep the flames from spreading. And the end of an era for a Portland outdoor adventure store. Why it's closing up shop after nearly eight decades. Good evening, everyone. Let's get right to an update on the man accused of stabbing two teenagers over the weekend on a MAX train. Thanks for joining us. I'm David Molko. And I'm Laurel Porter. And late this afternoon, we learned that suspect should not have been on the streets at all at the time of the attack. Let's go right to Mike Benner in downtown Portland with the latest. It just so happens that Adrian Cummins was arrested in mid-August for missing an earlier court appearance. There was a court order that he be held in jail until late September. But for reasons that are not yet clear, deputies in the jail turned him away. That put Cummins back on the street and at the center of this most recent case. One that we want to warn you is quite disturbing. That's Adrian Cummins in a Multnomah County courtroom Tuesday afternoon. Cummins pleaded not guilty to nearly a dozen charges, including attempted murder, assault, and bias crime. It's alleged that on Saturday evening, two 17-year-old boys, both black, were riding the max when Cummins yelled FN word at them and attacked them. Court documents suggest Cummins stabbed one teen in the arm and the other in the chest. That boy's heart was nicked by the knife. He had bleeding around the lungs, and his chest had to be opened for surgery. At last check, he was intubated in the ICU. Believe it or not, the result of only one of the crimes Cummins is accused of committing Saturday night. Court documents indicate that within minutes of the alleged attack on the teens, Cummins came to this checkers mart at 92nd and Flavelle and pulled a knife on the clerk and a customer who were trying to stop him from stealing some items. Officers eventually apprehended Cummins, who faced a judge Tuesday, and he'll be back in court before the end of the week for what's called a preventative detention hearing. All right, for those of you unfamiliar with a preventative detention hearing, that's when prosecutors will argue that Cummins is a danger to society, and they'll ask a judge to keep him behind bars as this case unfolds. We'll, of course, stay on top of it. For now, reporting in downtown Portland, I'm Mike Benner for KGW News. Let's get to your headlines now, starting with attempted murder charges for a man authorities say randomly stabbed two people in downtown Portland. Police say two weeks ago Saturday, 24 year old Moctezuma Garcia stabbed a man in the neck in Pioneer Courthouse Square. And then a short time later, a 10th and Morrison stabbed a man in the chest. Both attacks they say were unprovoked. Garcia was arrested that night for a parole violation. He's now set to appear in court next week. The man accused of repeatedly smashing out windows in Gresham has now been indicted for a fourth time. 25 year old Garrett Fine is now facing an additional 16 charges from an alleged vandalism spree on July 4th, including assault, attempted assault, unlawful use of a weapon and criminal mischief. Last week, Fine pleaded not guilty to charges stemming from three previous vandalism cases earlier this summer. He's being held right now on $30,000 bail and remains in the Multnomah County Jail. And in the past 30 minutes, we got an update from police on how a man escaped the state hospital. This was the guy that ended up stuck in a muddy pond last week. Oregon State Police say Christopher Prey was being brought back to the hospital from a medical appointment last Wednesday when he was able to take control of the vehicle and drive off. Police in Kaiser spotted the vehicle later that day, but say Prey took off onto I-5 and it, it just wasn't safe to chase him. It wasn't until the next morning that Oregon State Police learned about Prey's history and put out an alert to the public. It was then Friday morning when he was found in the pond. Happening right now, the Portland Public School Board is slated to vote on a plan to move up the timeline to replace the Grant Bowl Field. That's after Portland Parks and Rec, which owns and oversees that facility, said a replacement would have to wait until fall of 2024. That field has repeatedly failed safety inspections, which means while the public can use it, school teams cannot. 
The resolution also asks the city to lease the bowl long term to PBS so they can fund and oversee future improvements. And tracking the ongoing teacher strikes in southwest Washington, where families in the Evergreen and Camas districts are still waiting for the school year to begin. At this hour, there's been no breakthrough on negotiations between teachers and administrators in either of the districts. Evergreen and Camas have posted updates to their website saying there will be no school tomorrow as those talks continue. On Wednesday, Portland City Council plans to reconsider banning drug use in public. Now, if passed, the change would add drugs to an already existing ban on drinking alcohol in public, though there is a big legal hurdle, one that would require lawmakers or courts to take action in order for that ordinance to take effect. You might remember the mayor introduced something similar in June, but tabled it when the state passed a bill that strengthened criminal penalties rather for fentanyl possession. A former Portland police chief is now leaving her post in Philadelphia. Danielle Outlaw announced her resignation today. Outlaw is leaving the Philly force today to take a leadership position with the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey. Outlaw was hired as Portland's first black woman police chief in 2017 and left two years later to take the job in Philadelphia. In her three years there, she faced scrutiny for her handling of pandemic lockdowns, Black Lives Matter protests, and frequent turmoil over race and policing and a great day to be outside today all around the northwest with the clear sky we've got some scattered low clouds out around the north coast range but that's about it and it's really not going to change a whole lot look at downtown portland right now just a beautiful september evening still at 72 temperatures actually in spite of the sunshine a little bit below average we're going to correct that as we go into the weekend get back up around 80 degrees which is where we normally are for early september like this but I'll tell you what, it's hard to argue with what we've had and what's coming our way over the next several days, right? So clear, cool nights continue, mainly sunny days and warm days as well. There are a couple of chances of sprinkles coming at us, but no significant rain, not at all. We'll point out those times when we may get a few more clouds and a few more sprinkles, but really there's not much there. So really great conditions right on through the week and into the weekend. And maybe the most important thing or the best thing is there's no signs of big uh, plumes of wildfire smoke smoke coming our way guys. Yeah, keep it in perspective for us. Thank you, Matt. We're well, coming up at 630 on the story of progress report on Portland's first safe park village. Blair Best is in the newsroom. Blair, last time we talked, just a dozen or so people had moved their vehicles in. Are things getting any better? Well, tonight there are 25 RVs in the site and there's room for a total of 55. And it's not because a lack of referrals. In fact, more than 80 people have qualified to move in. What we found was that it comes down to the homeless people who are being referred Preferred are not ready to move in. Here's how it works. The Portland Bureau of Transportation alongside city outreach crews are in charge of picking which RVs move into the site and connecting with the homeless people. Now, one thing the homeless people have to do is pack up all their things and be ready to either drive their RV to the site or have it towed. And many times they just aren't ready. There are some folks that are ready for a community like this. There are some folks that just simply are not ready to even pack up their, their living location. Now, we also talked with people who are ready to move in, but haven't been properly referred yet. And that's all coming up tonight on The Story at 6.30. We look forward to that. Thank you, Blair. It's back to school for nearly all of the Northwest. And for the first time this school year, Oregon education officials are laying out recommendations on when teachers should and shouldn't <laughs> use artificial intelligence. Let's bring in Joe Ranieri now. Joe, there is so much buzz right there now is. around AI. Uh, what is in these guidelines here? Positive and negative uh, you know, in information as well. Now, David, these are pretty much ideas the Oregon Department of Education is laying out for teachers uh, on schools. Now, this technology is called generative AI which means it's technology that can produce text and images, among other things. Now, while I, AI has been around, this year many teachers are starting to use it in their classrooms for the first time. The Oregon Department of Education has a list for teachers that will help find ways to use this technology, and that includes everything from how to set up a learning lesson to showing students how this program could lead to a potential career in science and engineering. ODE says this will allow for teachers to better help their students when it comes to learning creating materials that meet a wide variety of, of student need, um, instructional need, um, very quickly and with a lot of efficiencies, producing you know, reading passages at various reading levels, uh, producing various styles of writing examples for students, um, even... 
ODE says it doesn't track how many schools use AI, but it plans on doing more research on how many do and how each district is using the technology. Yeah, really interesting to find out exactly how they are using it. Thanks so much, Joe.